Well, hello out there. I'm Maura Sharkey Prema, and I'm the president of the Association of Independent Music Teachers at Alberta College, or AIMTAC. And welcome to this third AIMTAC virtual professional development session we call Studio Secrets Panel Discussion. So part of AIMTAC's mandate is to support and inspire the independent music teacher in their path to enlighten others in their independent music studios at the Conservatory of Music. In this session, we're opening up the studio doors and asking our fellow colleagues at the conservatory what their tips and secrets are to running a successful private music studio. We'll also discuss the challenges they face in a time of uncertainty, particularly through COVID, and how they've weathered them. So whether you're a relatively new studio teacher or on an already seasoned veteran at the conservatory, this session is for all music teachers to share our experience, knowledge, and support. I'm proud to introduce our panel of distinguished guests, which you could see here in the gallery. We have pianist Reinhard Berg. He began as an instructor at the Alberta College Conservatory of Music in 1976. He's been an organist at St. Paul's Lutheran Church since 1961. And a fun fact, he's a member of the Alpine Club of Canada. Say hello, Reinhard. We have Geraldine Haythorne, who's been with the Conservatory of Music for 40 years and served as piano department head. Jerry has served as piano adjudicator for many festivals throughout Canada and sat on the steering committee for the Alberta Music Conference for many years. Say hello, Geraldine. We have violinist Frank Ho. He's been a faculty member at the McCune University Conservatory of Music for 23 years. Many of his concerts have been featured on the CBC, and he is currently the concert master of the Concordia Symphony Orchestra. Say hello, Frank. And we have oboist Beth Levia. She has been a teaching artist at the Conservatory of Music since 2011. She's played third oboe and substitute principal oboe with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra and frequently freelances with several Edmonton-based ensembles. She is currently a founding member of the Wild Rose Trio. Say hello, Beth. So I'd like to welcome all our guest panelists today. I'd also like to welcome those who are joining the live stream on our official AIMTAC Facebook page. This is a first. And um, if you have any questions for our panelists, we encourage you to type in your questions in the comment section below. And our social media manager, Elizabeth Gregaris, will take your, your questions. Uh, so this session will be recorded and it will be made available to viewing um, to paid AIMTAC members until May 26th and that link will be shared with our members via email this week. So to get things rolling as moderator, I will ask the first question to our panel and we'll let the fluid discussion go from there. So I'm just going to start the discussion, discussion with establishing and developing your studio. How did you get started with your music studio? So I'll start that question off with Jerry. How did you start your own studio? Oh dear. Well, I, I've i made notes on a lot of the things that you suggested we make notes on, Maura. And I have very little to say about this. I, I was very young. It was many years ago. I had just returned from studying in Toronto, still living at home with my parents, single. and not able to go back to the conservatory, not able to afford it. So I started teaching and discovered that this is my high in life. And so how I got students, I don't remember. Neighborhood students, um, uh, my own music teacher, Madame Mosanye, uh, but it just started. Fantastic. Fantastic. And let me ask you, Reinhardt, when, how did you begin your, your developing your private studio? Well, I have to be ashamed to say that I simply went to Alberta College. They said they needed a teacher, gave me a studio, gave me some students, and that was it. <laughs> I've easy, never easy. been very good at, at establishing studios or advertising or building up my business. I would say, looking back on my life, I've been a total failure at that. So I'm not much help here. Well, you were one of the very lucky ones where you had had the conservatory to help you with that. How about you, Frank? How did you get started? Well, I have to, uh, it's very similar to how uh, Jerry got uh, started. It sounds like you know, she wasn't really looking for it and neither was I. I was uh, quite young at the time. I was still in my early uh, 20s when uh, this 
profession just uh, developed. I was actually recovering from some uh, issues uh, with my, my arm at the time. And I was in the middle of studies in uh, London, England at the uh, Guildhall School. But this was a pretty serious um, problem. So I was uh, advised to come back to Canada to get uh, treatment, which I did. And luckily, you know, uh, parents and family and friends were uh, still here at the time. Uh, needed something to do, couldn't play. Uh, needed something to do. And my former teacher, James Keane, suggested, well, come and help me do some uh, teaching. And he had a you know fabulous uh, studio, some really ambitious students. And I kind of became a sort of, um, I guess, a sort of an assistant uh, to him and uh, started that way worked with some of his uh, students uh, on a weekly basis and began to do my own uh, teaching at the at the same time and it just took off uh, from there i have to say that um, it might have been a blessing in disguise because going into the performing field is a tough, it's a tough field maybe the side way i was um, uh, something that ultimately i'm enjoying much more now you know decades later so kind of just by happenstance you know and a little bit of luck i suppose and that's how i got started not that i would recommend this approach to uh, other people in their uh, early 20s you know starting off but that's what happened to me so that's my story wow so you had a mentor to help you yeah i was lucky through that. the door that's fantastic and how about you beth how did you come up with your own studio i, I think that what's um, the thread that's the common thread that's running through everybody's story is that it kind of happens organically that you show up and so somehow there's a student there for you. And for me, it was similar. I, um, I moved to Edmonton after I finished at McGill, a master's degree at McGill. And I came and I lived with my sister who, who has lived here for decades. And, um, then I started to get a little bit of work with the orchestra and I started to do in services with school music programs. And so music teachers um, came to know me and they would send their students to me. And I just built up my studio that way, um, gradually just building a reputation as a, as a teacher and a performer. And also I have the added, I guess it's a mixed blessing, um, of teaching the oboe. So there aren't a lot of teachers out there. So when uh, the band teachers came to know that there was an oboe teacher in town, they would send their students in. And I say that that's a mixed blessing because there aren't that many oboe teachers because there aren't that many oboe students. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, you have a very specialized instrument. So I'm sure you're, you've had some had to be creative in in uh, bringing in new students, which actually brings me to my next question. So this uh, and I, this is for any of you and any of you can just pop in and answer. So how did you find as you had your student as you had your studio moving forward? How did you find and keep new students? And did you have per, perhaps an interview process as you were um, maintaining these studios? Would anybody like to answer that? What do you mean by an interview process? Well, some studios, and I do, I'm one of them, actually interview students, potential new students. It's sort of like a meet and greet uh, where I get to know who the potential student is, answer any questions, things like that. Uh, it gives me a chance to, to see their abilities. It's sort of a, for me, it's sort of, well, this is a panel. I'm, I, I'm asking you guys, actually. So oh, yeah. my question is, how did, how did you require and retain new talent to your studio? Well, the, the interview at the beginning, that uh, that goes without saying, I, I would say. How about you, Jerry? Yes, I, I mean, in the beginning, as a very young teacher, I was just happy to have a new student. And But when my class grew and and some name recognition happened, then I began to interview students. but. It was very rarely that I did not take a student. Um, there, um, I don't know. I, I like I like all my students. I like people, and I could find some redeeming quality in in the student. 
sometimes it was the parent that made me say, I don't think I can work with this student. And that I'm sure has happened to all of us. Interesting. Interesting. Has, how about, how about you, Frank? How would you, how did you acquire or draw them into your new students to your studio? Yeah, very much similar to uh, what Jerry is just uh, saying. So in the beginning stages, it was just uh, good to get uh, the the referral. And uh, I guess at the time, being uh, quite young and naive, you know, uh, didn't look at the other uh, factors associated with you know, beginning a relationship with a student and also with uh, parents. But I would say that um, that was perhaps a necessary learning experience for probably for anybody is to well you, you really don't know uh, unless you go into the, the the situation right there's only so much they show at the beginning and as you work with them um over time then you know like you say you know layers of the onion start to um, peel away and you start to see more and more and so uh there was uh, quite a lot of learning experience um like luckily it was mostly positive uh, but, the, you know, I think I learned more from the you know, not so positive experiences, you know, be it the student um, himself or herself, or in some cases, the uh, parents. So um, well, over time, I have now uh, established a, um, a certain for students have made it very clear that I need to have the initial interview and, and audition see where the students are and how you know, get a certain you know feel for uh, who they are as a person i'd also like to meet with at least one of the uh, parents uh, and see where they stand and uh, that's usually quite informative and i found that what students want and what parents want are two very different things at times so if you're interviewing a potential student and their parent, and this is for anybody, um, what do you think are the important questions to ask? Even, Jerry, you mentioned the parent to the guardian. So what are important questions if, if you had a tip for the new um, studio teacher who's, who's just starting? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I like to talk to the student. And very often, particularly if the students are young, the parents will answer for them. And I try to make a point of saying the student's name in the interview and saying, you know, how do you feel about taking lessons? Do you like to practice? Um, you know, um, what school do you go to? And so often it takes a while before the parent finally recognizes that you really want to talk to the student and not the parent. Exactly. And then, well, I mean, I usually ask them if they can play something for me, unless they're a beginner, and I don't do beginners anymore. Uh, and, you know, it goes from there. It's, um, well, like Frank, you know, the more you do interviews, the easier they get. And yes. And do any of you, how do you assess new students, like to determine their ability and potential? Would anybody like to answer that? Here's a simple test I can give them. Sing happy birthday and tap your foot to that. If I see them tapping the rhythm of the song rather than the beat, then I know they have no sense of rhythm. And that's like 70% of the population. Interesting. Jerry, you were gonna, you have something to add to that? Um, yes, it's left me now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think that I have met very few unmusical students. I think that they're all, almost all people have a, a basic skill, if, particularly if it, they're an older student, if they're wanting to take lessons, usually there is some, there is some musicality there or they wouldn't be wanting to do this and pay money for lessons and, uh, and sacrifice time if they're older. Um, and so sometimes this is your job is to bring out that musicality. Frank, would you like to add to that? Oh, well, for me, the uh, proof is in the, uh, is in the playing. So 
it's uh, necessary for you know students if they're interested in lessons i need to you know have some you know way of um assessing where they're at but again with the case of beginners that's uh, not uh, possible um i do ask a lot of questions of the uh, students like what uh, their what their aspirations are in general and what their aspirations are uh, specific to the um to the instrument the violin and uh, i can really gauge pretty much where they where they're at where they're going to uh, go um based on listening to them play and also their responses um and if the parent is sitting in i'm not these days uh, sh shy to ask them what their expectations are for their own for their own child you know point blank and sometimes it can that can be al also pretty good because um i find that in some cases the parent and the child have not had that conversation and uh i'm providing in a way kind of a hopefully a safe uh place for them to kind of uh, let's get it out in the open begin this conversation because let's face it i mean that does um play into how the student is going to do in the long run you know mom and dad's expectations versus their expectations maybe they're you know diametrically opposite and uh we need to figure out a way of getting them you know to the uh, to the middle and you know temporary parents' expectations, you know, versus what the child is willing to do or can do, right? So kind of useful. So it becomes a little bit of a, a little bit of a therapy session or, you know, just a talk session for, for, the, for the parents and the children sometimes. And so. And to add to that, I've had not a few cases where after a year or two years, the parent realized I should be the one taking the lessons and not the child. And that's, and then they did. <laughs> they were completely wasted on the child. <laughs> and there you bring in new students to the studio. Beth, you, you have a bit of a challenge here. And actually we all have a challenge because as you know, we've all pretty much moved our lessons online. And so Beth, you've had this discussion because your instrument is unique being an oboe. And so how do you make assessments with new students and determine their ability when you're doing this on Zoom, because I'm sure, because you've said the instrument sounds quite different online. Yeah, it's, um, well, uh, whether you, what your opinion is of the oboe um, can vary dramatically, right? Just based on taste, but when you add Zoom into the mix, it's, um, the sound quality is very much more thin uh, and very, very pingy. But I would say that over Zoom, I don't really assess sound um, because it's, it's not fair to do so. But what I do is a lot of technique and some ear training. And it's actually, um, it's actually in a way been good because as oboists, we focus a little bit too much on our sound. And sometimes we don't put enough energy into ear training or um, rudiments, and we, we just get caught up in our sound. So with that off the table, we can really focus in on, uh, on just basic musical concepts. Um, and then just in terms of retaining or, or keeping students or, you know, anybody dragging an oboe behind them, I will teach. Anybody who can identify which end to blow in, <laughs> even if you can't identify it, I'll help you sort that out and I'll, I'll teach you. Um, and, and people learn the oboe for lots of different reasons. Uh, maybe they heard a recording that they really liked. Um, with kids, I ask them why, why the oboe? Why didn't you, why not flute? Why not drums? Why this? And, and invariably, I think I'm going to say 100% of the time, it might be 99.7% of the time, the answer is, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to do something different. I don't want to be one of a sea of clarinet players. I don't want to be the same. And so I get those students, I get the little mismatched socks of the musical world and I just adore them and I get them and they get me and 
even if they don't become great players, we have an hour a week to just be together and and make these weird sounds and feel good about it. And I think that's the joy of music is, is sometimes it is just coming together and it's a bit of a, it is therapy for, for the student and for us. Um, my next question is actually brings me to, be, again, because we have been working online, but also ties in with um, your lesson planning. And so in the before time, before COVID, we probably had a had a, a structure in the way we presented our lessons. So my question to you is, has your the way you have de delivered your lessons different? Have you had to restructure how how you deliver the lessons online? And we kind of talked touched a, a little bit on that just prior if I would just like to develop that a little bit especially those who maybe have not been accustomed to online teaching before COVID so uh, let me start um, I'm going to start with Jerry maybe if you want to tell us what you may have had to do differently or what has been the same for you in terms of your lesson planning and delivering it online well it I think has been much more difficult to teach online um, I think it's exhausting because you are focusing on a very small square on your computer and, and the sound is so bad. It's very difficult. I find it just um, difficult to work with students because you cannot hear the dynamics, you cannot hear phrasing, you have you often cannot see the keyboard completely for fingering. It's certainly been uh, difficult to teach online and I can't wait to get back to in-person teaching. Is there something new that you've had to incorporate being having to teach online? Um, nothing comes to mind, Mara. How about, how about you, Frank? You also, I mean, you're with violin now. Right, and that's uh, that's also challenging. Um, the tone of the violin does come out very differently on the, uh, over the uh, computer speakers. Um, so I've had to learn to uh, just not comment on that quite so much. Um, I can tell the students I suspect that uh, they may be doing something, you know, not so great uh and maybe advise uh, them to try some something a little different might get a you know tiny tiny change in the uh, in the uh, sound quality uh but not much so generally i don't uh, emphasize uh tone uh that much because honestly i can't i can't judge um what i've done though uh in other re respects uh, is pretty much the same so i do have a pretty clear uh, structure to the lessons or the technical elements always come first and you know intonation can still be judged on the uh, over uh, over zoom uh, so we begin with our, our scales and all that and that's easy enough to to, to deal with you know, this note too high or that note a little too low uh, and proceed on to maybe some uh, more higher uh, level technical work like uh, etudes and then finally uh, repertoire so i've kept the same structure uh, to the in-person lessons. Uh, just my thinking is that uh, we don't need any more adjustments to um, the current situation. It's already a big change for a lot of people to switch from in-person to uh, online. Do we need to um, make any other uh, changes? And for me, no. And it's worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, it is exhausting. You know, it feels a couple of days. I think I was Normally I can go several hours and not feel too bad, but uh, the first time I had was on Zoom, it was hard. You know, it was only three students, but I felt like I was, you know, ready to go to bed. Of that, <laughs> and maybe I did too. But uh, but I've, I've gotten used to it, and I've learned to you know just kind of expect uh, certain things from the students, a certain sound uh, quality uh, that I've learned to not you know, um, comment on too much, so. Right. And how about you, Reinhardt? Have you stuck to a fixed lesson plan, even online, or have you changed the way you, you work with students? 
I'm going to not answer that question, but uh, go into something that I know has been bothering Jerry right from the beginning and everyone else as well, which is the sound quality. And I think that uh, anybody watching that as a teacher should be interested in this. And I've sent things in emails. I don't know if they ever got posted. Um, there are two settings on your audio settings that you have to make sure you've done. One of them is called noise suppression. That always has to be on low. The other one is called automatically adjust microphone volume. That must be turned off if you don't do that. But even if you do all those things, I've come to realize that the engineers that designed Zoom designed it for what we're doing, which is talking. They didn't design it for music. Exactly. And uh, um, an example of uh, when you're talking, one person is talking at a time. And so if somebody's interrupting me while I'm talking, they probably have a way of, of suppressing that, which is not something you can control when you're doing your settings. But a, a very simple example is music is polyphonic. Now, if you're teaching an oboe lesson or a violin lesson, that doesn't come into play. But if you're, if you're playing something on the piano, it's polyphonic. There's more than one thing going on at the same time. And a simple test is to hold a note in one hand and do staccato, bump, bump, bump in the other hand, and you'll hear the held note being faded out and back in because the Zoom is not capable of listening to two things at once. And if the engineers had just simply said, here's the sound and it comes through, and we're not going to play around with it, we would be fine. But there's these engineers, they hire too many engineers and with too much time on their hands. And they think of all kinds of things to do, which are completely unnecessary. That's what I have to say about Zoom. Well, we're using Zoom, so I'm going to be very nice to them right now <laughs> at the moment. So Zoom is wonderful. It's a wonderful platform. But you are right. There have been extreme challenges um, is, with sound. Absolutely. So my next question is about keeping your students motivated, even for them who are working online. Uh, I know for myself, there were some that were just not ready to make that that change at all. Um, but how were you able to keep your students motivated and believe their own skills and realize their goals, even as you're working remotely? I'll, I'll ask Beth that question first. Um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, just over a year ago, I think, I think it's true of everyone, but I know I, I stopped teaching completely for a few weeks. Um, we hadn't really, couldn't really wrap our, our minds around online lessons quite yet. But it was my students who approached me and said, can we have lessons? Can we do video lessons? And gradually, all of them came back to me. And I think they were just, just like us, locked up in their homes. They wanted to have something to do. Uh, they wanted to feel somewhat normal. So they actually, they pulled me into it. I didn't start it and invite them to join me. So I didn't really have to motivate them. They, they were into it from the very beginning. Um, and then right away in June of last year, I had my first Zoom recital, <laughs> which was odd. It was very strange and everybody was awkward and but um but they all played and they all listened to each other and we came up with uh, our little instead of clapping because zoom will only pick up one speaker at a time so instead of a whole room being able to applaud we all had our little colored cloth that we would wave and this is what we came up with as a, as a way to acknowledge somebody's playing over this platform. And we didn't, you know, I've done another recital since then. I've got a third one coming up. But you know, I've only recently um, developed my own set of uh, exams, I suppose. Just, I, I mean, the buzzword is micro credentials. So just for my own studio, my students, I have developed five levels and and the criteria to to achieve each level and uh, and I'm going to start administering little mini exams to my students and when they make 
when they uh, pass that exam, they'll get a little gift and a certificate and something, uh, you know, just completely fabricated that I fabricated to put on their little mini little adorable bio. And, uh, and yeah, they're, um, I don't know if they're excited about it. I know I am, but that's something I've done. <laughs> I know I'm, I have everybody do this in the gallery as a sign of applause whenever we're, we're performing. Does anybody have any, anything they'd like to share how they keep their students motivated online and helping them reach their goals? How about you, Jerry? Well, I, um, <clears throat> yeah, motivation is difficult online, but when my students are, uh, when they are approaching um, uh, towards a, a finished piece, and um, I, they want, I want to change the piece, they want to change it, or we are preparing for an exam, I have them record their pieces on Music Memos, which is an Apple app, where you can hear much more than you can on Zoom. And, uh, Apple, I believe, has, has taken music memos off, but I, I now use voice memo, and it works very well. And so they send me a, a recording of that, and we listen to it together, and, um, and then we perhaps go on to the next piece. I did have some students who were doing uh, exams last year on YouTube, and I found this very difficult to... Um, for them to arrange. And um, at that point, cons the conservatory was, was quite confused about how to deal with all this. And uh, um, anyway, this year I am not doing any exams. It just seems too difficult to, to do this. So we, we try to uh, just complete our pieces to a standard of a festival standard or an exam standard and move on to another piece. And actually, that brings me to another question here. I'm getting feedback in my ear. Is now actually about exams and, and uh, auditions and its student recitals and having to move those online, particularly the exams. Um, we actually have that conservatory uh, scholarship competition coming up where now that has also moved online where the students have to present videos. So I guess my question to all of you is how are you helping your students prepare for what can be a very stressful time having to again having to pivot very quickly and and create a a performance that that they would have done in per uh, in person and, and and still create a level of i guess keeping that that the authenticity of the performance in a video who would like to answer that how about frank are you preparing any students for exams or competitions online and how are you preparing them yeah, I've actually organized um, a virtual uh, festival uh, through uh, the Alberta String Association. Uh, and it's actually province wide because uh, both Edmonton and Calgary have been affected by the cancellations or postponement of you know, the spring uh, festival. Um, and this, this actually came out of what happened last year uh, when you know, lockdowns, uh, the lockdown occurred. We were actually, um, my students were preparing for the, um, the Edmonton Festival and they had nothing to uh, work towards. Because that festival was canceled, as we all remember. Uh, uh, just out of, out of the blue, I asked some colleagues, would they be willing to uh, listen to my students if they prepare a video uh, performance? And I lined up several people who would act as adjudicators. So I created a little studio virtual festival about a year ago just to keep the momentum uh, going and I'm doing the same thing uh, this year and they my attitude is uh, basically that the students should pref uh, prepare to the same level in the same way as an in-person uh, festival or performance no different and uh, you know I think that's that's worked because that's helped keep uh, everybody on track certainly gives them a goal to work uh, towards and it just maintains a certain uh, level of practicing and uh, preparation uh, so and I guess that's just in line with my attitude of keeping everything as normal 
and it's plausible in abnormal times. Right until we pull through all of this, uh, I'm, I'm confident we'll get through it. But then, you know, when they come out of it, then it's really they emerge no, no, no different than uh, than before. So I think it's really important to keep that, you know, continuity uh, alive. Right. Hope that answers your your question. So we're we're just preparing the same way, no different. Exactly. And do any of you have any tips that, from your experience having prepared students for RCM? They moved online last year and they're continuing this year. Any of you have tips for your particular instrument for other for new teachers who are doing this as well? Mm, not really. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I would advise just keeping it as uh, as much uh, like before as uh, as possible. Certainly, my experience with RCM being an examiner, yeah, it's not ideal to be on the um, uh, the online platform, and it's hard to comment on tone. Uh, but other aspects, just keep it uh, as uh, much uh, as, as as similar as uh, as you can from uh, when things were done in person. Right. Here's one advantage to teaching online and maybe doing exams online is the same thing. I see the student on her own piano. In this yes. case, it's an electronic piano. And the, as soon as I saw her at her instrument, I said, holy cow, you're sitting like this much too low. And I got her mother to put like three pillows onto her. And if I hadn't, if I had only taught her here at my studio at home, I would never have found that out. It's interesting how we get to see our students in their space at home <laughs> and the distractions. I'm sure they, I mean, the, the occasional cat walking across the screen. Um, but, but like you said, Reinhardt, it is kind of eye opening to see how they are practicing at home. And so having this online opportunity is, has been uh, kind of beneficial in, in that respect. I actually, I'm going to sort of move the, the conversation about what people are using. I mean, since we've, again, we're, talk, we're still talking about online learning, but I want to talk about um, any, anything that you found, um, you found this was an unexpected upside, Reinhardt, having to see the students. Did any of you also find any unexpected upsides to teaching online as well? Or were there more challenges or difficulties than there were upsides? How Probably about you? There's one, other, there's one other upside. I had a student 10 years ago that moved to Calgary. A month ago, I got an email from her. Can I take online lessons with you and get back with you? She's in Calgary and I'm in Edmonton. So, yeah. so certainly distance learning. How about you, Beth? Is there, do you have any suggestions for those studios who are um, I mean, you've been acquiring some new technology in your studio. Is there anything um, for those studio, uh, maybe those teachers who are not comfortable, still not comfortable um, working from home and using the technology? Is there something you could recommend or any of you could recommend? <laughs> oh, my, my button wasn't working. Um, yeah, not really. Um, I've got some equipment and I've been using different platforms. And so it seems that my equipment doesn't work so well on, on Zoom. But if I'm live streaming over Twitch, for example, then it works a little bit better um, because I go through uh, um, an audio program called Audacity that um, that Zoom doesn't use. So, um, you know what, I think that I would, if somebody's not used to using any equipment, I would just stick to what comes default with Zoom or with whatever platform you're teaching over. Um, some people prefer Skype. Um, I know people have been doing FaceTime lessons for people who are using Apple devices. Um, I think whatever is the most comfortable, whatever you feel the most comfortable with. Um, it's a weird, it's a very strange thing to have to learn um, suddenly 
to, to not have any lead time into just boom, start teaching online. So if you can, if you found something that works, do it. There, there oh. are no rules. One thing that uh, about what works, it took me with some of my students half a year to convince them to not use their iPad. Do not use iPads when you're teaching or taking lessons online. You have no control over the audio settings. Interesting. How about, is there any certain pieces of equipment or soft? I mean, Jerry, you mentioned you, you're using voice memos. This is a question for any of you. Now that you've been online, do you have any certain pieces of equipment, software, apps, websites that you use that you that you just started using or you've been using before COVID that you would recommend to your students and to other music teachers as well? How about you, Frank, with, with violin? Oh, I, I use an assortment of, uh, of platforms. I actually gave the, uh, the choice to, to the students, uh, and I just put myself in the position of uh, willing to learn, the, uh, you know, to use like Zoom or Skype, uh, you know, FaceTime. Uh, those are the three that most people uh, prefer. So I've gotten pretty uh, proficient uh, with that. But um, I haven't actually added any, uh, it's, accessories to my uh, existing computer. I'm just using my, um, my iMac uh, right now, and that's this is where I do the online uh, teaching. Um, I guess that's something that I could uh, explore. There's quite a few options out there. I know that it can be a little bit bewildering, <laughs> confusing, uh, depending who you talk to uh, about, you know, uh, speakers or microphones, uh, whatever. But uh, the upside for me uh, has been one to learn to use these uh, different platforms well, better. I don't think I would have been exposed to uh, these so so much so extensively. Uh, two, I actually think that uh, in terms of uh, scheduling uh, lessons, sometimes students can't show up for whatever reason. It's like, okay, well that's fine. We can just switch to online rather than having you know over one week they have this uh, format and that keeps them on uh, on track and they don't you know miss so many lessons and I don't have to you know end up making up a whole bunch of lessons uh, in the end so that's uh, one upside for me uh, and I've incorporated it into my you know, studio policy for uh, this past uh, year is like you know if there are any extraordinary circumstances you're welcome to just switch to the online if you can't make it uh, in person so Yes. And actually, I'm glad you brought up studio policies, because I'm sure all of us had to relook at our studio policy since COVID and uh, make amendments to them. Were there any specific amendments any of you made to your studio policies? How about you, Jerry? Well, I find myself teaching almost every day because if students can't make it um, on a certain day, then I'm home all day and so I say well let's you know, can't make your Tuesday lesson can you make it on Wednesday and particularly now when students are home uh, learning online or university students online that you know we can set up a time that suits both of us um, and so yes I end up teaching on a Saturday or a Sunday and I don't mind I really don't mind I'm I was just going to mention when um, Reinhardt was talking about the upside of, of a student from Calgary that, yes, I have had two students contact me, previous students, uh, a young man from McGill who was back at McGill working on his doctorate in physics, and a young man from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who called, who emailed me through, he found me on the conservatory website and said, are you teaching online? And so I'm working with him. And it's interesting, I had not seen this young man since he was 14 years old. And here he was living in, going to school, he'd finished university in Chapel Hills or North Chapel. Uh, anyway, Chapel Hills, North Carolina, yes. So it's interesting to find um, uh, previous students who have contacted you for lessons. 
And you're right. It's so interesting to see how people are reaching out from such a distance. And, and I think that's a huge benefit for the conservatory overall, because now they can say we have more international students maybe coming. <laughs> and we can even advertise that in a, as for ourselves as studio teachers. Yeah, I'm teaching students internationally. So if anything, the benefit of teaching online is 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 that outreach for sure we're coming to the end of our session can you believe this i do have another question for all of you though um and it's actually about your materials and resources like nothing says pro like preparedness so do any of you have any method books or digital resources that you consider like gems for your students or for your studio now i know all of you are in different different instruments but we've got different viewers watching so maybe frank do you have any gems any specific resources that you love for your studio or your students um i mean i have certain uh, books that i go to and I would highly recommend uh, depending on the level of the uh, student and their um, for the beginning uh, students uh, just mention it to you know violin teachers who might be listening in uh, the uh, Kurt Sassman's house violin method is excellent for starting uh, students because it's right you know to the point and uh, very accessible uh, and a little higher up I mean I'm going to say that I I'm a big fan of scale books now. So a tune a day scale book is very good. And uh, the Hans Wesley comprehensive scale manual is good. And for the advanced students, you must have them uh, practice the Carl Flesch scale system. Let's put that out there. And those are now the mainstays of my, my studio. Anybody who gets in with me at any level can expect those books to be um, you know, required purchases. Oh, wow. How about you, Reinhardt? Do you have any gems that, that are a must? Well, I, I, the, the, you know, uh, there's books that I use and there's books that I thought were really, oh yeah, there was one really, really good one. Uh, very creative. I forget the name of it now. And I quickly realized for that to work, uh, the, the parent would have to be with the child like 100% of the time. Uh, it, 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 it was like all unfamiliar material. I, I use other books. Basically, what I say about books is I hold my nose and use them. And students have said to me, why don't you write your own book? And I said, yeah, I could. But I know I'd have to sell lots of copies to make the effort worthwhile. So I just use a book, change everything in the book. And I say, cross that out. Don't do this. Ignore three quarters of the book because it's a waste of time. And, uh, and do I put it together. And it depends on the student, you know, and uh, what I do is different for every student. And uh, it's something you discover as you teach what the student's abilities and predilections are. How about you, Jerry? Do you have a gem that you, your go-to resource? Well, yes, I think so, like Frank. It depends on the, uh, the level of the student. I mean, for my very senior students, I like to use uh, uh, two exercise books. One is Doc Nani. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to coordinate. Or there's the Brahms 51 exercises that I use uh, for technique um, for um, elementary and um, lower senior students like grade nine rather than 10 or ARCT. I use a, uh, I use Cherney Studies Hannon, I do because I think that uh, Hannon is is interesting, and I do it in different keys, not just C major. Um, but you know, you are in Hannon. You were playing a, a thousand notes over and over and over again, and and so you're developing uh, key speed with your fingers, which is so important and. Um, and with the early students, I use things like dozen a day. They seem very simple, but when you're working with a six or seven year old, that that's it's not easy. And I think this is one of the things that I have tried to do all my life. I still belong to a professional group of pianists who we work, we learn new pieces every year so that we do not forget how difficult it is to learn something new. And um, 
And because I don't perform a lot, I do this. I do pick up a piece of music and work a new piece once or twice a year, something that I have never played. And I do find it difficult to learn to do this. That's interesting. So this is a group of, of teachers who get together and... Yes, it's called the Robachen Club. And it, it, I think there are 20 teachers in the, in the group. And we usually hire someone from the States or London to come and do master classes with us. And we all play for each other. And, uh, and, and this person is our uh, coach. And we do this twice a year. That's fantastic. Yeah. That if only there was something for singing in that way. Well, we have conferences, but this is quite unique because you come together as colleagues. Yes, yeah. it's been going on for 50 years or more. And Fantastic. Calgary has started a similar type of group. And um, I, I'm, I, like, I like doing that. I like the camaraderie. We are almost like a family. Well, fantastic. Well, speaking of camaraderie, we actually have a comrade who was watching this. There's somebody watching this live stream and actually has a question uh, for the gallery. So we have a question here. What is the funniest experience you have had teaching online? Who would love to share? Who has had a funny experience teaching online? I can tell you how many cats have stu stuck their butt in front of the camera while I'm teaching. Uh, that's always funny. Anybody like to share a funny experience? I, I don't think I've had any really funny experiences. I had an, um, an interesting experience um, a couple of weeks ago with a student who, whose father had a, a visitor come and they were in the kitchen and they were talking so loud that I could hardly hear what my student was saying. So I had to ask my student to go and ask her father to be quiet, please. <laughs> So this is it too, because they are in their homes and I find it hard to tell a student, can you please move your cat? Or I do tell them to move the cat or yeah. <laughs> there's other outside forces that are a distraction, like a toddler walking into the room, wanting the attention of a sibling, things like that. Barking dogs. <laughs> Barking dogs, absolutely. Well, folks, this is the end of our session. Can you believe it? You did it. We made it. <laughs> I I certainly hope our our um, p uh, the panelists. I hope you've enjoyed yourself today. I want to thank each and every one of you for your time. I'd also like to thank our viewers who are watching the Facebook live stream on AIMTAX Facebook page. This was a first, and we hope a first of many. If you liked this session, or if you have an idea of presenting, or have an idea for an AIMTAC professional development session online or in person, which we hope to do next year. Year, just drop us a line at aimtech.advisor at gmail.com. And I'm also going to do a quick plug. We have another seminar, actually a webinar happening next week on Wednesday, May 5th at 10 a.m. till noon. It's an interactive session called Improvisation in Classical Music, and it's going to be led by AIMTAC's own Reinhard Berg. And this session will feature live demonstrations and a viewer participation is encouraged. So if you're interested, if you have, um, you would like to uh, join, just send a, a request to aimtech.advisor at gmail.com. So with that, I'm also going to just ask the people here in the gallery to just, just stay in the, in the gallery. And uh, maybe we'll just say goodbye to our audience. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you in our next session. Take care.